Next, we want to hear from Dr. Shannon Barris, who's a pediatric and adult neuro-ophthalmologist also at Stanford University. And she's really focused on pediatric conditions. And she's working on projects using handheld OCT in infants and young children. She uh, contributes to multi-site studies in pediatric optic neuropathies, crani cranial neuropathies, pseudotumor cerebri syndrome, and optic pathway gliomas. And she's going to help us understand pediatric patients with optic dystrusin and uh, look at the mechanisms of visual loss. Great, thank you, Kathleen and um, Dr. Moss. Um, it is my pleasure to be able to present the information about pediatrics. So I have no disclosures. Today I'm gonna to talk about the differences in presentation between children and adults of optic dystrusin, as well as um, recognizing the different parameters that occur during the maturation of the eye in the pediatric timeframe. So starting with a case, um, this is a 14-year-old girl who comes in, or actually her mother, um, her last vision exam was in Mexico at the age of six, and they got a random phone call from an optometrist out of the blue that said she needed to have an appointment. Mom still does not know why she got that phone call. And of course, she goes to the optometry office and they ask, do you have blurry vision? And she says, yes. And they say, do you have headaches? And yes. Um, so she also gives a history of having had nausea for the last month, although this wasn't a complaint um, that was brought up to a pediatrician or escalated to any uh, care provider. So she, at the optometry visit, they noted that there was an abnormal optic nerve appearance, which was sent, then, then she was sent to me. So at my clinic, her vision was 20-20, um, near and at distance. Her pressures were normal, her color plates were normal. And uh, sure enough, her optic nerve did look abnormal. She had this hyperemic nerve um, with so this complete blurring of the nasal border on the right side. And she had a much more um, blurring of the border on the left side with obscuration of the vessels. So this is what the optic nerves look like. Here on the right side is her, uh, here on uh, your left side is her right optic nerve. As you, you can see, it's a crowded disc. Here on the left, you can see that there's some obscuration of the vessels here. And now this leads her on to essentially the Tour de France of the uh, photo suite that we all know so well. She had a B scan, an OCT, autofluorescence, and a visual field. And at this case, uh, at this point, you wonder, do we worry or not worry? Well, if I wasn't worried, I would watch and wait. I would wait for about a four to uh, four to eight. Uh, see them back in about four to eight weeks. Um, if I was worried, then I would proceed with a brain MRI, an MRV uh, of the brain, a lumbar puncture, and labs. So where do you fall as a provider? Uh, can you tell this mom that this is not a brain tumor? And if so, if you still think that there's, if, if you can't tell them it's not a brain tumor, then do we send them straight to the emergency room to get the MRI, the MRV, and the lumbar puncture? Will they need sedation? If they need sedation, maybe it's a straight shot to an admission. Um, so the, the, these are the questions that here in pediatric we often um, are faced with. And this is not an all too uncommon scenario in pediatric uh, neuroophthalmology and in pediatric ophthalmology as a whole. We often get the question of, is this papilledema or pseudopapilledema? Now, unfortunately, these kids do often kind of times come with symptoms, but sometimes they don't and they're often prompted. Do you have a headache? Do you have nausea? And then all of a sudden now we have an eight-year-old boy who has headache when they came in just to their routine screening for their eye exam. And these patients then get worked up based on this concern that there could be something else going on to increase intracranial pressure. However, the nice thing is that oftentimes uh, pediatric neuroophthalmologists also see adults. I too see adults two days a week and the presentation is invariably different in the adult population. Here in the adult population, as you already saw with Dr. Um, uh, Joyce Liao, they often come with the diagnosis of, I have drusen. And it's obvious, we can see that they have drusen and that is not the console question. They have, um, you know, I know this is a simplification, but they have much more concerns about what is the treatment? What is the vision, the visual field loss over time? How can we present, how can we prevent that? So I think the crux of the matter is that the pediatrics come with this 
baggage in the beginning of is this or is this not even optic disc fusion? So is this just a are the presentations actually different or is this just treating the child parent dynamic just a different scenario? So way back in 1975, this was sort of, this is even in the beginning, it says a fallacious similarity between the elevation of the optic disc caused by uh, buried drusen and optic disc edema caused by increased intracranial pressure presents a problem of differential diagnosis expressly in the younger children. That is still true today. So is this just a predicament of children more than adults? Is it because we don't have any prior exams or our exams are limited and challenging? Could it be that the kids always have a complaint? My head hurts, my back aches, my knees ache, I've got a spot on my arm. Or is it the parent concern, which is invariably the question, does my child have a brain tumor? Is this a predicament of, uh, oh, sorry, uh, there are studies to look at whether or not this is truly a predicament of children more than adults. And Malmquist and both of the most, more recent studies show that the, there's more anatomical changes during the childhood period. There are also case series and case reports, multiple of them, showing that the development of superficial drusen is during the first two decades of life. And headaches do come as the most common presentation. Santavori uh, presented a case, uh, presented a case, uh, presented a series with uh, Urkilla showing that over 50% of the kids who came in with the differential papilledema versus pseudopapilledema came with a diagnosis uh, or with a, a symptom of headache. So starting this from the beginning, I know we're going to take sort of a 3,000 foot view looking down on this, is, is optic distrusion congenital? Well, we know that there is a couple different um, supporting theories and that there's anomalous vessel branching. There are vessels of different caliber size in these kids than in, uh, in, in, in adults than in um, the general population. About 40% of kids in a study of 92 kids had a ciliaretinal vessel, which is uh, not that common in general population. And we know that there's an association with ushers and retinitis pigmentosa that's going to be discussed further today by other colleagues of mine. And we know that there are cases of familial hereditary cases. Is this acquired? There are cases of optic nerve tumors causing uh, and then finding a, a diagnosis of optic distrusion. There's cases of uh, papilledema in that um, in uh, a case for, uh, a study from Bernbaum et al. showed that patients were 10 times more at risk to having optic distrusion after the resolution of papilledema. Could there be both of these existing? Could there be a risk factor and an insult causing uh, the idea of a second hit hypothesis? So what are the risk factors? Are they structural? This theory of, this, of a small scleral canal, a, a disc at risk that Dr. Liao was just talking about, does this lead to extrusion of axonal materials such as mitochondria that then calcify? Are there pressure gradients? There's translaminar pressure gradient flow across the optic nerve. Is there concern of intraocular pressure and intracranial pressure and the difference between the two? We know that these drusen are more often in the nasal, uh, in the nasal area of the disc which oftentimes are where papilledema and glaucoma also show changes in the disc, which are known pressure gradients, and therefore is drusen another victim of pressure gradients? Is it metabolic? Is there a disturbance in axonal metabolism? Are there other things we haven't thought about? So I think we have to essentially start from the beginning if we're gonna put forth the theory that this could be congenital. And of course, uh, eye organogenesis is not my favorite topic, so we'll go quickly. But we know in the second month here over on your left, which is looking at the 44 day of gestation, the optic stock has been formed and the neuroblastic layer of the retina has begun. Here on, um, on the right side is 90 days of gestation where the nerve fiber layer is forming. At the fourth month, we know that the uh, retinal vessels grow into the nerve fiber layer near the optic disc. And by the eighth month, we know that the optic nerve is myelinating posterior to the scleral canal. But what happens in the growth of the eyes in, in the pediatric population? We know the axonal, axial length by about the age of two uh, is uh, two to five is about the time frame that you're closest to the size of an eye uh, of an adult eye. We know the intraocular pressure increases to about age five, and by that point, we're around the same um, intraocular pressure of an adult eye. The optic disc and uh, nerve growth. We know by age one, you're at 95% of the size of an adult eye. And then we look at the Brooks membrane opening or the scleral canal opening, and we don't really have much um, 
Uh, we don't have much evidence to support the early age group, but we do know um, based on the study by Malmquist in Copenhagen that age 11, that they are about the same scleral canal opening as adults. This is looking at the scleral canal of Brock's membrane opening and their measurements there were done in the Copenhagen study. So looking back at um, 1993, Rimmer did a nice post-mortem study of 95 pediatric eyes and they looked to see that the optic disc is about the same size around the age 10 as, a, uh, as an adult eye. And in the optic nerve, it is about the same um, size at, around the age of two. So here you look at age two, looking at the diameter of the optic nerve. And from this point forward, the nerve is about the same size as an adult as it is in a child of two years of age. So of course it doesn't end there. There are times when the eyeball continues to grow and we know that there are changes with myopia. The scleral canal here actually doesn't seem to grow. Um, however, there are changes posterior to that and tilting of the nerve. So the story I think is gets much more complicated in terms of looking at axial length of the eye as the eyeball grows, but that's gonna be discussed later on. So here's a typical timeline if I pull it all together of what happens in children. So we think around the age of eight, we see pseudopathledema starting. Uh, we have some case reports of longitudinal studies in kids. Here in um, uh, Friesen's uh, study, he followed a four-year-old kid got about with known pediatric, uh, with known drusen in the family. And at four, there was no drusen by ultrasound. By age eight, there was buried. And by 12, it was faintly seen and then superficial drusen essentially stayed the same after that. Studies also 56 year follow up by Malquist. Uh, Malquist looks at um, starting at a child at age 16 and seeing that this continues to um, stay the same in the adult period, essentially the third decade and past. So what is going on? Is there migration of drusen calcification or is the RNFL melting away? So I figured we should then put a summary slide together of what the growth of the eye looks like prior to these, these changes in optic distrusion. Axial length, as you can see here around age 12 is about the same size as adulthood. And the intraocular pressure around the age of five, the optic nerve and uh, optic disc are about the adult size by about age one to two. And the scleral canal opening, we don't really know prior to age 11 or 12, which is an opportunity for research as to what does the scleral canal look like prior to the age of 12. So are there, uh, that's normal um, development, but are there deviations from norm? The axial mm -hmm. length, there's a couple studies looking at the differences in, um, does this actually, are there differences in the axial length in children with optic distrusion? And we found that there weren't any differences in axial length. There's no studies looking at intraocular pressure. And looking at the disc diameter and the um, size of the optic nerve, these were all in adult studies. There are no children's studies looking at this. The scleral Shannon, canal opening study by Malmquist just looked and found a smaller scleral canal opening in children with distrusion. However, in um, Dr. Uh, um, Floyd's study, um, out of Utah, they found that the scleral canal opening was actually larger in adults. Maybe that's actually a deformation of the scleral canal as they become more superficial. So back to our case, of course, this child went on for a lumbar puncture, MRI, brain, uh, and labs, which are all normal, was given a diagnosis of very distrusion. So what are her risk factors? The only risk factors we could come up with is that she does have a smaller scleral canal opening, but nothing else. Her ICP, uh, IOP, disfamer were all normal. So could any of this test have been avoided? So I'd like to end there by um, summarizing that pseudopapilledema comes with headaches, which is the most common presentation in the childhood period. The risk factors may be structural, but these are dynamic during the first two decades of life. And there is no uh, normative data for scleral opening canal within uh, after the age of 11, but we actually don't have any data regarding this earlier because OC, the invention of OCT uh, was not back when these studies were first being studied, or when these um, uh, postmortem eyes were first being studied. So I'd like to end there. Aaron, want to take any questions? Um, so Sh Shannon, unfortunately, we're out of it's my mic. Mm -hmm, you're good. Um, Shannon, unfortunately, we're we're out of time. So we'll address questions during the discussion period. Perfect. Thank you, everybody.